Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this video is intended for my AP Biology students. For us right now, this is chapter 19, and it's about taxonomy and systematics. That's going to be this video, video one. And then video two, I'm going to discuss phylogeny and specific, specifically um, cladograms. All right, so I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller and then remind you that the notes that go along with this presentation are located down in the descriptor. And this also, those notes are two columns. Column one is scaffolding. I'll help you fill that in. And I tell my students in column two to put in pictures. Um, and then also there's a link to this presentation I'm giving right now in case any of these images are helpful for you. All right, I wanna remind us um, what we're doing, this is all part of Unit 7 for the College Board, and we're going to focus on two topics, common ancestry and phylogeny. And I took a shot, a screenshot of those. Um, you can read through this about what the expectations are for phylogeny and for common ancestry. This right here is a link that I make for my students um, that has all of the College Board expectations for Unit 7, as well as some helpful reviews. So you're welcome to have that. Just click on that link. All right, so let's use this as an analogy. We have, I don't know, 14 or so screws right here. How do we classify those? How, if we had to organize them, how would we do that? Is color important? The length important? Um, the ends of it important? And that's basically what you're doing with all of life. What, what would you do? When you look at all of life, and all of this is macroscopic, I don't even see bacteria, which is, there's more of that than anything else on this planet. So how do you classify them? How do you decide what's important? What groups you put them in? What are the criteria? Does it show who they evolved from, their ancestry? What do you do about something like wings or fins? Do you need to look at the structure to build those wings? Is that important? And yes, I'm referring to convergent evolution. So the process of systematic, um, is that you're studying biodiversity, all of life. So that's the first thing in your notes. Systematics is the study of biodiversity. And it's a quantitative science. That means it's not how we feel, but it's something we can measure, right? And you use traits of living and fossil organisms to infer relationships amongst or organisms over time. So I think that's the one thing you need to put in your notes to infer relationships among organisms over time. So that process is um, hopefully reflects um, not uh, maybe appearances per se, but we wanna look at things like their DNA to help construct their phylogeny. That would be more accurate. When we look at some of the naming systems that we have, for instance, this is a giant panda and here's a red panda. So most people would think, oh, panda, panda. Okay, they must be closely related. But the giant panda actually shares an ancestor with bears. And that shares an ancestor with um, the raccoon and the red panda. So the red panda is more closely actually related to a, a raccoon than a raccoon than a giant panda. So that's what we're trying to differentiate out. So when you study taxonomy, this is a branch of the systemic biology where you're, you're looking at systematics, right? This organization to show phylogeny. So you're trying to identify, name, and organize all the biodiversity into categories. And these categories, as we work down from domain all the way to species, they become more exclusive, right? More exclusive. And a taxon is a group that shares those traits. So on your notes, Organized systematics. And um, the other part, I think you have taxons already there for you in your notes. All right. So um, when you're doing this, as I mentioned before, you really have to watch out for convergent evolution when you're deciding, like, do I put them in this group? Are they more similar? or into this group, that decision-making, um, you want it to be quantitative. You need to look at structures. For instance, these two wings, you've got bird's wings versus bee's wings. Yes, uh, they both fly, but structurally they are very, very different. They have just solved the problem that they have moving through the air in the same way by using wings. Um, and that is what's called an analogous structure um, as a result of convergent evolution. So you have to be careful of those when you're assigning groups. So um, um, on your classification, on process of naming and assigning organisms, um, have to be careful of traits that are a result of convergent evolution. That's the word you need. And today, um, systematics, 
um, tries to put them in their natural groups based on their evolutionary development. And you're, you're constructing a phylogenetic tree, and that is phylogeny. And you can use DNA technology to look back to see when they diverge from one another um, in order to correctly place them in that tree. So the only word you need there is place, to correctly place organisms in the tree of life. And that's going to be our final slide in this whole chapter in video two is the entire tree of life. So before, if we look back historically about Linnaeus, um, he was the father of binomial nomenclature and just using just the genus and species names instead of a whole bunch of descriptors. So this is going to be small, but I'm going to show it to you right here. For example, prior to Linnaeus, if you wanted to talk about a honeybee, this was its name. Yes. Yes, two lines, all of these italics. And instead, it became just Apis mellifera instead of this long name. So it was a, a great simplification. So for Linnaeus taxonomy, two-part Latin name, two-part Latin name. And as I said there, it may reference a trait, a location, a person, or a character, whoever found this, right? And um now, what's an, an addition is domain. So all of life on this entire planet can fit into three baskets, these three domains, and we'll be discussing them just a little bit. And then within those domains, they have kingdoms. And within that, each kingdom has phyla and then classes, orders, families, genus, and species. So, and you want to set these up, these groupings based on evolutionary history. Now to help my students remember this, I give them this little phrase, did, for domain, did King Philip come over for good soup? Did King Philip come over for good soup for domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species? So on your notes, um, you have all of that al already. Um, these current categories are just the best hypothesis of evolutionary relationships, of evolutionary relationships. And the newest way to do this and to place them is actually called DNA barcoding. And um, my students, you're gonna have a highly suggested reading and thinking about this, um, but what they're trying to do is isolate DNA from organisms, amplify it, and if you remember how to amplify it, this right here would be a thermocycler, right? So you could do PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, then you sequence them, and then you compare the results sequences against databases and if you follow this um, this will take you right to the site to show you where they're doing the DNA barcoding so that's the newest way of classifying organisms okay so this next part is a review um, but I want to make sure it's in your head for our discussions today so the first thing we've talked about speciation and the process of speciation before in previous chapters I want to remind you that it's hard to identify and classify when males and females look different from each other right we, we call that sexual dimorphism where they look different and there's reasons why nature would select them to look different right we've already discussed that another one that's difficult when you're trying to to classify species is if they're asexual, right? Because we say a species can interbreed and they share a common gene pool. Well, if you're not having sex, it's kind of hard to decide that. Um, another issue, um, so here's your definition. A species can interbreed and share the same gene pool. All right, and um, then you have hybrids, right? Like zebroids, the horse zebra hybrid. So remember, if they can reproduce the zebroid, then they would be considered their own species, right? And if not, then no. All right, um, and then subspecies. For instance, we are Homo sapiens sapien. We are actually a subspecies, and that can help differentiate out a little bit more. So um, I wanted just to put that out there before we start this process. Another one I wanted to review is divergent evolution. Remember, in divergent evolution, you have a common ancestor, and then you split off and go your own ways. Um, and you may use uh, use it for different structures. Like there's uh, the homology of the humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, meta, metacarpals, phalanges, right? But what that gets used for, whether you're a sloth, a cat, or a bat, is very different. So that would be a form of divergent evolution. Um, so here are those homologous structures I just referenced. <laughs> 
And then um, convergent evolution, I already mentioned that, right? That you're exploiting your environment in the same way. So you can look at fish fins versus whale fins or dolphin fins. Those are very different, right? Because dolphins and whales are both mammals and they have that same structure of that form, like what we have, but they have it in their fin, right? But fish do not. So those are what's referred to as analogous structures. They do not have common ancestry, but yet they have a structure that is very similar looking, right? And so you have to look out for all of these when you're developing your phylogenies. All right. And then parallel evolution, a classic example for that is when you look at mammals, right? Mammals had a common ancestor, but 65 million years ago, continents are breaking up. And so you have very unique mammalian um, fauna um, on each continent. And, and so they have traits, you have organisms like here, let me give you one right here, I think I but yes, here's a placental mouse and a marsupial mouse. They look very, very similar. Um, they have, if you go way back, they have that same ancestry of a mammal, but they ended up solving the problem in the same way based on their environment. So that is parallel evolution. So just a quick review. Here's a little chart. If it's helpful for you, you can screenshot it and put it in your notes. All right. So here we're comparing sheep, cattle, red deer, and reindeer, right? And so you can see red deer and reindeer have a common ancestor right here, right? And cattle and sheep have a more close, have a common ancestor, and you can trace them back. And this is built, this is built on their evolutionary history. And here, um, when we look at the classification of man, um, I like my students to learn this just because I think it's interesting, but we look, we're in the domain Eukarya, right? You know that there's archaean bacteria, we're in Eukarya. We're in the animal kingdom, um, phylum chordata. If you remember that we have a notochord, right? That develops into our spinal cord. Um, I'm sorry, our notochord, which um, induces our epidermis to form our spinal cord, okay? So we have a dorsal rod um, supporting that. Now we lose that immaturity because it becomes our vertebrae, um, but we are still in phylum chordata. Class mammalia, because we have hair and mammary glands. Order primates family hominidae, and then genus, homo, and then species, you combine that, homo sapien. All right, so now that we have that background, let's do the next part, and that is the three domain system, and hopefully this is still a review for my students. Um, so when we um, set up the three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, when you compare our RNA, remember there's three kinds of RNA, um, mRNA, three main kinds, mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. rRNA with proteins forms ribosomes. And when you compare the rRNA sequences, it shows that bacteria and archaea branched early on from LUCA, and then later eukarya branched away from archaea. So on your notes, you're comparing rRNA sequences. And um, RNA is great to use. It mutates um, very, very slowly. Um, next, I would put nuclear DNA, and then I would put the, the what uh, mutates the fastest is mitochondrial um, DNA. All right, and that'll become important just a little bit. Um, so overview of bacteria. Um, you want to know that they are unicellular prokaryotes. They have circular DNA, no, no histones. Remember, histones, when we talked about um, the linear eukaryotic chromosomes, how they would wind on those spools, okay? Those are the histone proteins. Um, eight of them form a nucleosome. They reproduce asexually. They do have a sex pelvis, though, usually in times of stress, environmental stress then you can have a sex pelvis extend and they can exchange some DNA that way. Um, most are heterotrophs, very, very important in our ecosystem, cyanobacteria, remember the oxygen revolution about uh, 2.3 billion years ago, flooding the earth, uh, making aerobic respiration um, um, possible, and also as decomposers, they break down organic nutrients. Some are parasitic and some cause disease. So you have a couple words you need to fill in your notes. Most are heterotrophs. Um, probably the first organisms to contribute to the oxygen revolution, important in ecosystems. Um, some bacteria are parasitic and cause disease. 
Okay. And then archaea, our extremophiles, right? They also are prokaryotes, so they do not have a membrane enclosed um, DNA, right? They don't have a nucleus. Um, their DNA is circular, like um, bacteria. They do, however, have some introns. Remember, we talked about exons and introns. Um, in, we cut out the introns and leave the exons or combinations of exons to mature the embryo mRNA before it leaves the nucleus to go out on the ribosome. They have some introns and they also have some organizational hist um, histones like eukarya. These are extremophiles that live in salty, salty conditions or hot conditions. They also reproduce asexually. Most are chemoautotrophs. Um, there are no parasites and very few phototrophs. They are different from bacteria. Um, their rRNA is different. Um, and their cell membranes, they have branched phospholipids. We don't, we have linear. They have branched phospholipids. Um, also their cell walls, if they have them, do not have peptidioglycan in them. So they, there are some differences there. On your notes for archaea, I think you just need to pop in the word underneath number one. Instead, they are chemoautotrophs and um, which allows they have different, what's different from bacteria are their cell membranes, um, which allow them to function at high temperatures. Um, they have some introns and histones like eukarya. And then the third domain, domain eukarya, these organisms will be um, unicellular all the way to multicellular. Sexual reproduction is very common. Um, you have autotrophs and heterotrophs, and they have membrane-bound nucleus instead of a nucleoid region and organelles. So on your notes there, I think the only word you need there is sexual reproduction is common. And that, my friends, is the end of part one in video. Oh, I have one more picture. I lied. Um, sorry. In the domain eukarya, I broke it down to the four main kingdoms here for you to review, and I'll help you differentiate between them. Okay. Um, protista, you're going to have both autotrophs and heterotrophs. They are eukaryotic, but primarily unicellular, but you will have some multicellular organisms. We've talked about slime molds. Fungi are what's called absorptive heterotrophs. Um, they can be multinucleated. They're in the dirt, but they are still heterotrophs, right? They are not autotrophs. Plants are um, primarily here multicellular and they um, do photosynthesis. And then animalia are called ingestive heterotrophs. We bring those nutrients in and we are all multicellular in the animal kingdom. All right, um, video two, I will discuss phylogeny. And if you're one of my students, I'll see you in class.